This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 17 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kwame Genov. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash K W A M E G E N O V V. The Yegg. Section 1. Weeks and months pass without clarifying plans of escape. Every step, every movement, is so closely guarded, I seem to be hoping against hope. I am restive and nervous, in a constant state of excitement. Conditions in the shop tend to aggravate my frame of mind. The task of the machine men has been increased. In consequence, I am falling behind in my work. My repeated requests for assistance have been ignored by the overseer who improves every opportunity to insult and humiliate me. His feet wide apart, arms akimbo, belly disgustingly protruding, he measures me with narrow, fat eyes. Oh, what's the matter with you? he drawls. Get a move on, won't you, Burke? Then, changing his tone, he vociferates. Don't stand there like a fool, do you hear? Next time I report you, to the hole you go. That's me talking, understand? Often, I feel the spirit of Cain starting within me. But for the hope of escape, I should not be able to bear this abuse and persecution. As it is, the guard is almost overstepping the limits of my endurance. His low cunning invents numerous occasions to mortify and harass me. The ceaseless dropping of the poison is making my days in the shop a constant torture. I seek relief, forgetfulness rather, in absorbing myself in the work. I bend my energies to outdo the efforts of the previous day. I compete with myself and find melancholy pleasure in establishing and breaking high records for turning. Again, I tax my ingenuity to perfect means of communication with Johnny Davis, my young neighbor. Apparently intent upon our task, we carry on a silent conversation with eyes, fingers, and an occasional motion of the lips. To facilitate the latter method, I am cultivating the habit of tobacco chewing. The practice also affords greater opportunity for exchanging impressions with my newly acquired assistant an old-timer, who introduced himself as Boston Red. I owe this development to the return of the warden from his vacation. Yesterday he visited the shop. A military-looking man, with benevolent white beard and stately carriage, he approached me, in company with the superintendent of prison manufactures. "'Is this the celebrated prisoner?' he asked, a faint smile about the rather coarse mouth. "'Yes, Captain, that's Berkman, the man who shot Frick. "'I was in Naples at the time.' I read about you in the English papers there, Berkman. How is his conduct, Superintendent? Good. Well, he should have behaved outside. But noticing the mountain of unturned hosiery, the warden ordered the overseer to give me help, and thus Boston Red joined me at work the next day. My assistant is taking great pleasure in perfecting me in the art of lipless conversation. A large quid of tobacco inflating his left cheek, mouth slightly open and curved, he delights in recounting ghost stories, under the very eyes of the officers. Red is initiating me into the world of D-Road, with its free life, so full of interest and adventure, its romance, joys, and sorrows. An interesting character, indeed, who facetiously pretends to look down upon the world from the sublime heights of applied cynicism. "'Why, Red, you can talk good English,' I admonish him. "'Why do you use so much slang? It's rather difficult for me to follow you.' I'll learn you, pard. See, I should have said teach you, not learn. That's how they talk in school. Have I been there? Sure, boy. Gone through college. Went through it with a bucket of coal, he amplifies, with a sly wink. He turns to expectorate, sweeping the large shop with a quick, watchful eye. Head bent over the work, he continues in low, guttural tones. Don't care for your classic language. I can use it all right, all right. But give me the lingo, every time. You see, pard, I'm no gun. Don't need it in me, biz. I'm a yeg. What's a yeg, Red? A supercilious world of cheerful idiots applies to my kind the term tramp. A yeg, then, is a tramp. I am surprised that you should care for the life of a bum. A flush suffuses the prison pallor of the assistant. You're as stupid as the rest of them, he retorts, with considerable heat, and I notice his lips move as in ordinary conversation but in a moment he has regained composure, and a good-humored twinkle plays about his eyes. 
Sir, he continues, with mock dignity, to say the least, you are not discriminative in your terminology. No, sir, you are not. Now, looky here, pard, you're a good boy, but your education has been sadly neglected. Catch on? Don't call me that name again. It's offensive. It's an insult. Entirely gratuitous, sir. Indeed, sir, I may say without fear of contradiction that this insult is quite super vicinious. Yes, sir, that's me. I ain't no bum, see? No such damn thing. Eliminate the disgraceful epithet from your vocabulary, sir, when you are addressing yours truly. I am a Yag. Y A double G, sir, of the honorable clan of Yagmen. Some spell it Y E double G, but I insist on the A, sir, as grammatically more correct, since the peerless word has no etymologic consanguinity with henfruit, and should not be confounded by vulgar misspelling. What's the difference between a yeg and a bum? All the diff in the world, pard. A bum is a low-down city bloke whose intellectual horizon, sir, revolves around the back door with a skinny handout as his center of gravity. He hasn't the nerve to forsake his native health and roam the wide world, a free and independent gentleman. That's the yag, me by. He dares to be and do, all bulls notwithstanding. He lives, aye, he lives, on the world of suckers, Thank you, sir. Of them, tis wisely said of the good book, they shall increase and multiply like the sands of the seashore, or words to that significant effect. A yag's the salt of the earth, pard. A real, true-blood yag will not dine to breathe the identical atmosphere with the city bum or gay cat. No siree. I am about to ask for an explanation of the new term, when the quick, short coughs of red warn me of danger. The guard is approaching with heavy, measured tread, head thrown back, hands clasped behind, a sure indication of profound self-satisfaction. How are you ready? he greets the assistant. So-so. Ain't been out long, have you? Two and some. That's pretty long for you. Ah, oh, I don't know. I've been out of four years one set. Yes, you have. Been in Columbus then, I suppose. Not on your life, Mr. Cosson. It was Sing Sing. Ha <laughs> ha, you're all right, Red. But you'd better hustle up, fellers, and put it in ten more machines, so look lively. When's the machines coming, Mr. Colson? Pretty soon, Red. The officer passing on, Red whispers to me. Alec, pretty soon is just the time I'll quit. Damn his work in the new machines. I ain't no gay cat to work. Think I'm a nigger, eh? No, sir. The world owes me a livin', and I generally manage to get it, you bet you. Only mules and niggers work. I'm a free man. I can live on my wits. See, I don't never work outside. Damn if I'll work here. I ain't no office seeker. What do I want to work for, eh? Can you tell me that? Are you going to refuse work? Refuse? Me? Nixie. That's a crude word, that. No, sir, I never refuse. They'll knock your damn block off if you refuse. I merely avoid, sir, discriminately and with steadfast purpose. Work is a disease, me by. One must exercise the utmost care to avoid contagium. It's a regular pest. You never worked, did you? You bloke, he hisses. Shut your face. The screw'll pipe you. You'll get us in the hole for chewing the rag. What's your hee-hawing about? He demands, repeating the maneuver of pretended expectoration. Do you mean to tell me your work? I am a printer. A compositor, I inform him. Get off. You're an anarchist. I read the paper, sir. You people don't believe in work. You want to divvy up. Well, it is all right. I'm with you. Rockefeller has no right to the whole world. He ain't satisfied with that either. He wants a fence around it. The anarchists don't want to divvy up, Red. You get your misinformation. Oh, never mind, pard. I don't take stock in reforming the world. It's good enough for suckers. And as Holy Writ says, sir, blessed be they that neither sow nor hog. All things shall be given unto them. Them's wise word me by. Moreover, sir, neither you nor me will live to see a change. So why should I worry me not about it? It takes all my wits to dodge work. It's disgraceful to labor, and it keeps me industriously busy, sir, to retain my honor and self-respect. Why, you know, pard, or perhaps you don't, Greeny, Columbus is a pretty tough dump. But do you think I work the four spot there? Not me, no, sir Didn't you tell Kossan you were in Sing Sing, not in Columbus? Course I did. What of it? Think I'd open my guts to my lord, Big Head? I've never been within thirty miles of the York pen. It was Hail Columbia, all right, but
but that's between you and I, Savi. Don't want the screws to get next. Well, Red, how did you manage to keep away from work in Columbus? Manage? That's right, sir. Tis a word of profound significance, quite adequately descriptive of my humble endeavors. Just what I did, buddy. I managed, with a capital M. To good purpose, too, me by. Not a stroke of work in a four spot. How? I had Billy with me. That's me kid, you know, and a fine boy he was, too. I had him put a jigger on me, kept it up for four years. There's perseverance and industry for you, sir. What's putting a jigger on? A jigger? Well, a jigger is... The noon whistle interrupts the explanation. With a friendly wink in my direction, the assistant takes his place in the line. In silence we march to the cell house, the measured footfall echoing a hollow threat in the walled quadrangle of the prison yard. Section 2 Conversation with Boston Red, Young Davis, and occasional other prisoners helps to while away the tedious hours at work. But in the solitude of the cell, through the long winter evenings, my mind dwells in the outside world. Friends, the movement, the growing antagonisms, the bitter controversies between the Mostanier and the defendants of my act, fill my thoughts and dreams. By means of fictitious, but significant, names, Russian and German words written backward, and similar devices, the girl keeps me informed of the activities in our circles. I think admiringly, yet quite impersonally, of her strenuous militancy in championing my cause against all attacks. It is almost weak on my part, as a terrorist of Russian traditions, to consider her devotion deserving of particular commendation. She is a revolutionist. It is her duty to our common cause. Courage, whole-souled zeal, is very rare, it is true. The girl, Fedya, and a few others, hence the sad lack of general opposition in the movement to most attitude. But communications from comrades and unknown sympathizers germinate the hope of an approaching reaction against the campaign of denunciation. With great joy I trace the ascending revolutionary tendency in Der Arme Tüffel. I have persuaded the chaplain to procure the admission of the ingenious Robert Reitzel's publication. All the other periodicals addressed to me are regularly assigned to the wastebasket by orders of the deputy. The latter refused to make an exception even in regard to the Knights of Labor Journal. It is an incendiary anarchist sheet, he persisted. The arrival of the Tufel is a great event. What joy to catch sight of the paper snugly reposing between the legs of the cell table. Tenderly, I pick it up, fondling the little visitor with quickened pulse. It is an animate, living thing, a ray of warmth in the dreary evenings. What cheering message does Reitzel bring me now? What beauties of his rich mind are hidden today in the quaint German type? Reverently, I unfold the roll. The uncut sheet opens in the fourth page, and the stirring pian of hope's prophecy greets my eyes. Grus and Alexander Berkman. For days the music of the dawn rings in my ears. Again and again recurs the refrain of faith and proud courage. Schon ruste schiste Freiheit schar, so heiglin in Scheidung schlacht. Es senden zwei und zwanzig Jahr, wir lechten ein Sturmisch Nacht. But in the evening, when I return to the cell, reality lays its heavy hand upon my heart. The flickering of the candle accentuates the gloom, and I sit brooding over the interminable succession of miserable days and evenings and nights. The darkness gathers around the candle as I motionlessly watch its desperate struggle to be. Its dying agony, ineffectual and vain, presages my own doom, approaching, inevitable. Weaker and fainter grows the light, feebler, feebler, a last spasm in all its utter blackness. Three bells. Lights out. Alas, mine did not last its permitted hour. The sun streaming into the many-windowed shop routs the night and dispels the haze of the fire-spitting city. Perhaps my little candle with its bold defiance has shortened the reign of darkness. Who knows? Perhaps the brave, uneven struggle coaxed the sun out of his slumbers and hastened the coming of the day. The fancy lures me with its warming embrace when suddenly the assistant startles me. Say, pard, slept bad last night? You look boozy, me lad. Surprised at my silence, he admonishes me. Young man, keep a stiff upper lip. Just look at me. Permit me to introduce to you, sir, a gentleman who has sounded the sharps and flats of life, and faced the most intricate network, sir, of iron bars between York and Frisco. 
always acquitted himself with flying colors, sir, merely by being wise and preserving a stiff upper lip. See the point? What are you driving at, Red? They's a going to move me down on your row, now that I'm in this here shop. Dunno how long I shall choose to remain, sir, in this magnificent hosiery establishment, but I see there's a vacant cell next yours, and I'm going to try and land there. Are you next, me by? I'm going to learn you to be wise, sonny. I shall, so to speak, assume benevolent guardianship over you, over you and your morals. Yes, sir, for you're my kid now, see? How? Your kid? How? My kid, of course. That's just what I mean. Any objections, sir, as the learned gentlemen of the law say in the honorable courts of the blind goddess? You bet your life she's blind. Blind as an owl on a sunny midsummer day. Not in your damn smoky city, though. Sun's ashamed here. But way down in my Kentucky home, down by the Suwannee River. Suwannee Riv... Hold on, Red. You are romancing. You started to tell me about being your kid. Now explain. What do you mean by it? Really, you... He holds the unturned stocking suspended over the post, gazing at me with half-closed, cynical eyes, in which doubt struggles with wonder. In his astonishment, he has forgotten his wondered caution, and I warn him of the officer's watchful eye. Really, Alex? Well, now, damn, I've seen something of this here round globe, some mighty strange sights, too, and there ain't many things to surprise me, let me tell you. But you do, Alex. Yes, me lad, you do. Hadn't had such a stun and blow since I first met Cigarette Jimmy in Oil City. Innocent? Well, I should snicker. He was for sure. Never heard a ghost story. Was fourteen, too. Well, I got him all right, all right. Now he's doing a five-bit down in Kansas. Poor kitty. Well, he certainly was a surprise. But many tempestuous billows of life, sir, have since flown into the shoreless ocean of time. Yes, sir, they have. But I never got such a stunner as you just gave me. Why, man, it's a body blow, a regular knocking out to my knowledge of the world, sir, to my settled estimate of the world's supercilious righteousness. Well, damn, if I'd ever believe it. Say, how old are you, Alex? I'm over twenty-two, Red. But what has all this to do with the question I asked you? Everything, me by, everything. You're twenty-two and don't know what a kid is. Well, if it don't beat raw eggs, I don't know what it does. Green? Well, sir, it will be hard to find an adequate analogy to your inconsistent immaturity of mind. Aye, sir, I may well say of soul, except to compare it with the virtuous condition of green corn in the early summer moon. You know what moon is, don't you? He asks, abruptly, with an evident effort to suppress a smile. I am growing impatient of his continuous avoidance of a direct answer, yet I cannot find it in my heart to be angry with him the face expressive of a deep-felt conviction of universal wisdom, the eyes of humorous cynicism, and the ludicrous manner of mixing tramp slang with classic English, all disarm my irritation. Besides, his droll chatter helps to while away the tedious hours at work. Perhaps I may also glean from this experienced old-timer some useful information regarding my plans of escape. Well, do you know a moon when you see it? Red inquires, chaffingly. I suppose I do. I'll bet you my corn dodger you don't. Sir, I can see by the tip of your olfactory organ that you are steeped in the slough of densest ignorance concerning the supreme science of moonology. Yes, sir, do not contradict me. I brook no skeptical attitude regarding my undoubted and proven perspicacity of the human nature. How's that for classic style, eh? That'll hold you down a moment, kid. As I was about to say when you interrupted, eh, what, you didn't? Ah, oh, what's the matter with you? Don't you go now and ruin the ele elegant flight of my rhetorical pegasus with an insignificant interpolation of mere fact. None of your lip. Now, boy, and let me develop this sublime science of moonology before your wondering gaze. To begin with, sir, moonology is an exclusively aristocratic science. Not for the pretenders of Broad Street and Fifth Avenue, Nixie. But for the only genuine aristocracy of D. Road, sir. For the pink of humankind. For the Yagmen, me, lad for yours truly in his clam. Yes, siree. I don't know what you are talking about. I know you don't. That's why I'm going to chaperone you, kid. In plain English, sure, I shall endeavor to generate within you post luminous comprehension a discriminate conception of the subject at issue, sir, by divesting my lingo of the least shadow of imperspicuity or ambiguity. Moonology, my Mark Twainian innocent, is the truly Christian science of loving your neighbor, 
provided he be a nice little boy. Understand now? How can you love a boy? Are you really so dumb? You're not a rough boy, I can see that. Red, if you'd drop your stilted language and talk plainly, I'd understand better. Thought you liked the classic, but you ain't long on lingo neither. How can a self-respecting gentleman explain himself to you? But I'll try. You love a boy as you love a poet song heifer, see? Ever read Billy Shakespeare? Know the place? He's neither man nor woman, he's punk. Well, Billy knew. A punk's a boy that'll... What? Yes, sir. Give himself to a man. Now we're... Now we's a-talkin' plain. Savvy now, innocent abroad. I don't believe what you are telling me, Red. You don't believe? What the devil? Damn me soul to hell. What do you mean? You don't believe? Gee, look out. The look of bewilderment on his face startles me. In his excitement, he had raised his voice almost to a shout, attracting the attention of the guard, who was now hastening towards us. "'Who's talking here?' he demands, suspiciously eyeing the knitters. "'You, Davis?' "'No, sir.' "'Who was them?' "'Nobody here, Mr. Cossum. "'Yes, they was. I heard hollering. "'Ugh, that was me,' Davis replies, with a quick glance at me. "'I hit my elbow against the machine. "'Let me see it.' "'The guard scrutinizes the bared arm. "'Well,' he says doubtfully, "'it don't look sore. "'It hurt, and I hollered.' "'The officer turns to my assistant.' Has he been talking ready? I don't think he was, Captain. Pleased with the title, Coulson smiles at Red and passes on with a final warning to the boy. Don't you let me catch you at it again, you hear? During the rest of the day, the overseers exercise particular vigilance over our end of the shop. But emboldened by the increased din of the new knitting machinery, Red soon takes up the conversation again. Screws can't hear us now, he whispers, except they's close to us. But watch your lips, boy. The damn bull's got sharp lamps, and don't scare me again like that. Why, you talk so foolish, you make me plum forget myself. Say, that kid is all to the good, ain't he? What's his name, Johnny Davis? Yes, a wise kid, all right. Just like me own Billy I told you about. He was no punk, either, and don't you forget it. True as steel, he was. Stuck to me through my four spot like the bark to a tree. Say, what's that you said? You don't believe what I endeavored so conscientiously, sir, to drive into your noodle? You was only kidding me, wasn't you? No, Red, I meant it quite seriously. You're spinning ghost stories, or whatever you call it. I don't believe in this kid love. And why don't you believe it? Why, er, well, I don't think it's possible. What isn't possible? You know what I mean. I don't think there can be such intimacy between those of the same sex. Ho <laughs> ho, that's your point? Why, Alex, you're more of a damn fool than a casual observer, sir, would be apt to postulate. You don't believe it possible, you don't, eh? Well, you just give me half a chance and I'll show you. Red, don't you talk to me like that, I burst out angrily. If you... Yeah, easy, easy, me by, he interrupts good-naturedly. Don't get on your high horse. No harm meant, Alex, you're a good boy, but you just rattle me with your crazy talk. Why, you're bugs to say it's impossible. Man alive. The dumps chuck full of punks. It's done in every prison, and on the road, everywhere. Lord, if I had a plunk for every time I got the best of a kid, I'd rival Rockefeller, sir. I would, me by. You actually confess to such terrible practices? You're disgusting. But I don't really believe it, Red. Confess hell. I confess nothing. Terrible. Disgusting. You talk like a man up a tree, you holy sky pilot. Are there no women on the road? Pshaw. Who cares for a heifer when you can get a kid? Women are no good. I wouldn't look at him when I have my prushum. Oh, it is quite evident, sir. You have not delved into the esoteric mysteries of moonology, nor tasted the mellifluous fruit on the forbidden tree of... Oh, quit. Well, you'll know better before your time's up, me virtuous sonny. For several days, my assistant fails to appear in the shop on account of illness. He has been excused by the doctor, the guard informs me. I miss his help at work. The hours drag heavier for lack of Red's companionship. Yet I am gratified by his absence. His cynical attitude towards women and sex morality has roused in me a spirit of antagonism. The panegyrics of boy love are deeply offensive to my instincts. The very thought of the unnatural practice revolts and disgusts me. But I find solace in the reflection that Red's insinuations are pure fabrication. No credence is to be given them. Man, a reasonable being, could not fall to such depths. 
he cannot be guilty of such unspeakably vicious practices. Even the lowest outcast must not be credited with such perversion, such depravity. I should really take the matter more calmly. The assistant is a queer fellow. He is merely teasing me. These things are not credible. Indeed, I don't believe they are possible. And even if they were, no human being would be capable of such iniquity. I must not suffer Red's chaffing to disturb me. End of section 17 This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.